Uh, we're really fortunate uh, and thankful that uh, Darius, uh, you can join us uh, today Thank at Startup you. Grind. Um, how many of you guys have used 99Co? Ah, but one third. Yeah, that's about yeah. right. Yeah, we are about one third market, so that's, yeah. that's correct. So you got the. You got representative market share here. So um, you're kind of a bit of a serial entrepreneur. You started a company called 10 Cube, grew that, sold it to McAfee, uh, and then uh, worked at McAfee for a little bit. Um, how did that experience inform your decision to go and start 99Co? You already went through the startup and then you wanted to do it again. You meant why would I quit a cushy job? <laughs> Um, I, I guess I got the bug, and it's just something that I'm addicted to. Um, and uh, and I mean, McAfee is great; it's a great company. It was part of Intel at that point. Um, so, um, but I, you know, I, I think we made a few. I, I made a few key decisions. The first startup was a software company, it's a security app you can download on your phone. Today it's called McAfee Mobile Security Company. They rebranded it, um, and um, it. But you know, 99% of the time. So 99% of our customers are users are overseas, and I have not met a single one of them in real life, right? So, and, we, and, if, and especially in, in the case of security, if you're doing your job, people don't even know you exist, right? So I wanted to do something that is a lot deeper. So when after the exit, spend a, few, a, a bit of time in McAfee, we just think about, okay, what is meaningful to me? So I want to do something very deep. It has its consequences, it has its costs, and we can talk about it in a bit. Um, that which is, you know, touches people's lives, for real. And I wanted to say in Southeast Asia. Um, so that was a clear decision, okay, let's come back and do something new. That's great. And why 99Co and going into the property space? Because there was already some, you know, the market was, you guess you could say, heavily entrenched uh, with some of your competitors. Um, but you really came in and disrupted things uh, when you entered the scene. Why? challenge uh, you know some long-standing competitors uh, and, and you know try to disrupt that space versus going in another angle and starting something from scratch yeah um, this is a great question it's a good question we keep asking ourselves all the time <laughs> so this is yet another thing that's different about this company compared to my last company so this is like I think this is like a four walls very frank sharing right just I try to be as, as honest as possible You're on camera. Um, oh I am on camera <laughs> shit uh, damn it uh, can't be honest. Of course I can. I don't care. Uh, anyway, um, so the last company was making something completely new. It didn't exist in the market. It, we were inventing it because we saw a problem. Um, my co-founder was losing his phone all the time. He thought there was a security problem. We made something up. Didn't exist before we started it. Uh, in this case, we are going up against a very powerful incumbent. It was a, it was a, a different journey that I completely were not prepared for. So it has its, it has its pros and cons. Um, the pros is that it's very clear target, very clear benchmarks. If you're winning, you know it. If you're losing, you, you know it. Um, the last company, you don't know whether you're winning or losing. You don't know whether there's going to be a need that's going to grow to absorb the product that you're trying to create and how big that need is. It's a question mark. Um, but back to the question of why we started to begin with, um, I think it's a lot to do with, it started with A, me as a user wanted a, wanted a I would say a better product, but maybe to be fair, a different product at the minimum. At the minimum, I wanted a different product. It started as simple as I was searching for a place to rent, and I was working in Science Park at the time, and I had just gone flip flipping between you know, our competitor, incumbent competitor, Property Guru, which had 95% market share when we started. Um, that uh, I just have to clip flipping between Property Guru and, and Google Maps just to find out what bus to take, how long it takes. Every single unit that I'm trying to rent, I have to map that out to understand, okay, am I really, is this really a place I want to rent? Would I, would, I, would I instead want to pay $200 more to save 10 minutes or save five minutes walk? You know, I've, I've made those trade-off decisions all the time. It was as simple as that one single use case. We started from there and we just dig in and realize, oh, you know, there's so much more renters, buyers, they have so much different needs that's not being addressed and we thought that it's a product that's needed. Um, I'm happy to talk about the agent side as well, um, and, uh, uh, if, you, if you're interested as well. And there's a whole different set of problems that agents are facing. Right, and also, you know, this is when people are looking at creating a startup or creating a product, you know, they, they see somebody that's got the predominant market share and think there's got to be a better mousetrap, there's got to be 
features that we can do that are different. So, you know, actually having somebody there existing in the market can also inform the decision of what you should do uh, as well versus if you were just going greenfield into something kind of brand new. Um, but going back to the agents, you know, because this is a very important part of your business, uh, the listings that they do there. Tell us a little bit more about how, you know, because you're catering to consumers like us that are home buying and shopping around for property, but at the same time, it's also, you know, your customers are also the agents. Uh, that's correct. Um, so one of the other theses, we, it wasn't right in the beginning that we understood it. It took us about maybe six months to really understand the real estate world, the agents, we talk to them, we follow them, we see what they do. Um, we back some of them to let us follow them in their work and see, you know, how do they put up listings, what do they actually do with it. To really fully understand that one of the biggest complaint really is that property group, being a monopoly, natural as it is, um, keep increasing their price every year and on, almost on average, I think, double the price every year, something like that. Um, so, um, and I think that's kind of a telltale sign for us to say, well, okay, actually the problem is not just with the consumers. The, the agents want an alternative as well. Um, and more important than the fact that the price increase, which is not necessarily a problem in itself, the price increase in a manner that allows the richer agents to get richer by having their listings more on top, by paying more. Um, so that actually created a second layer of problem which we understood, oh, why are the photos so bad? Why are the content so bad? Why is it every time that I, I look and say, why is, why is this thing shitty? Because there's no incentive to improve it. That actually, at the end of the day, is what it is. The more money you pay, um, the more list, le leads you get because the higher you rank. And so that's one of the, the other problem we discovered over the six months process to realize that, oh, so that means you do have, you, you're not giving the, A, you're not giving the users the best results, and B, you're not giving the agents the incentive or the agents who want to do a better job in put, taking better photos, writing better descriptions, um, better results. Um, and on top of that, the third problem is that you are actually eliminating a lot of agents who may not have that much income. Maybe they're doing it on a part-time basis and so on, and they, they don't want to spend as much money. So they're not getting customers contacting them, even though they actually have a property on hand that you know, the customer might actually be interested in. So we stitching the two ends of the market together, we realize, oh, hey, this, this opportunity not just on the customer side, on yeah. the consumer side. Yeah. So that really, you know, you, d you did your homework there. Um, how long before you guys had an, a minimally viable product to get out there to the market? What was that process like to, you know, get everything ready and launched? Yeah, I think that's where we are a bit fortunate. I started with a team that was already technically very strong. I had my co-founder Connor with me, um, and we already have a running team working on other projects, which is experimenting. So we were able to get a test product out in the market within something like 12 weeks. Um, so I think it was, I, 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 but I think it was be because there was a lot of groundwork that was done before that. This was that well, the team was already there and kind of working together and they didn't have other distractions in their lives. Um, so I think that, that was quite fortunate in our case. Right. And getting that team and building that team in the early days, um, how important was it uh, to have that team set in place from the get-go and then build from it from there? That's a very difficult question to answer um, because it has this is cost as well. The cost is that you have a baggage of you basically, like at, at, at the point I think we had four people who were working on it full time. Uh, but that means they are not doing a full time job somewhere else. There's opportunity cost to the time. That means it, force, it forces you to accelerate your process. And the pros is that, well, you have no choice, right? You burn your bridges, you have to do something. Um, the, the con is that it might force you to do something before you fully understand what you're doing. And, and, and I think we, in our case, we probably tend towards that end. We, along with our characteristics, our, our, you know, our, our, our culture of being a little bit reckless, a little bit naive, a little bit with unchecked optimism. So we just like, okay, dive straight into it. I don't know how hard it is, but let's just do it. Just run, run head on into it. It's good advice. You know, a, a lot of startups, I think, that's advice we hear quite a bit at Startup Grind is, you know, just run head on into it and, you know, don't try to, you know, be timid about things uh, and expanding. It might kill you, but it's faster. <laughs> It'll be a quick death, you know, exactly. perhaps, but um, quick and painless. Uh, and, you know, so you were able to grow, get some market share. Um, talk to us about the struggles going through that and to acquire 
market share in this hotly contested space uh, in Singapore? Um, so I think the, the hard part for us is getting the agents on board. So I think as, as with any marketplace, um, the hard part is getting your suppliers on board and keeping them there. I think initially, if you go to, go to one of our agents and say, that, why don't you list your properties with us? They're just like, okay, sure, why don't I give it a try? So that's not that hard, especially when it's free, because we were free for the first two years. But even when it's free, um, if they put it for a week, two weeks, and they don't really get a lot of results, they don't get a lot of customers going to them, even if there's real customers, it still takes time for them to put the listings and manage it and so on. So um, I think that's the hardest part. Um, for us to really um, do both at the same time, get enough agents on, t on board where the, the consumers looking for properties can find something useful. Um, it, it may be especially something that they cannot find somewhere else. Uh, at the same time, deliver enough customers to the agents for them to keep coming back. So that's really difficult and I think it's one of the things that we, for, I don't know whether it's right or wrong, but for whether it's correct or correctly or wrongly, we raise quite a bit of money for it. And we decided that that's what, that was the way to jumpstart it, and that's, that's how we did it. And let's talk about that fundraising. Your last round last year, you raised about $8 million U.S. dollars uh, from Eduardo Saver and a couple of other investors, uh, pretty well known uh, in Singapore. Talk to us about that process and uh, you know, just what the fundraising scene has been like for you uh, in the rounds that you've done. Um, I think for us, quite fortunately, again, that was pretty um, quick and um, pretty... Um, easy. Uh, I think that was, for us, uh, maybe to take a step back, uh, this is very different from maybe the last company. So 10 years ago, it was an entirely different scene. No, nobody existed. Five years There's ago, no, it was a completely different scene even in five Singapore years ago, as right? well. Even yeah. five years ago, it was a completely different scene. Um, I think for us, it was pretty quick and pretty easy. But I think the, the biggest thing for us, at least in our context, is that we were a company that you could really clearly see the market size for. And I think that's often one of the biggest challenge for Southeast Asia companies. Um, if you are domestic or regional company even, most of the time you don't have a proven market size. You don't have, you know, are you big enough for a VC investor? Which is not necessarily a bad thing because you don't always want VC investors. I think that's one of the things that I want to, you know, if I may send very clearly, you don't always want VC investors. VC saying no doesn't mean necessarily it's a bad thing. Um, there are many ways to build a business. So, um, but in our case, it's a very clearly venture-driven business. It's a large business, and it wouldn't exist as a, it wouldn't exist wouldn't succeed as a small business. It has to be a large business. So we have to raise capital to do it. I think in, in that case, I think we were the right fit for venture capital. Right. And also, you know, going back to your other point, it's a symbiotic relationship. You need the users, and you need the suppliers, and the suppliers also need the users as well to to see traffic. So. You know, you're kind of building two businesses at the same time. Um, what insights can you impart on us uh, for that? Because there's a lot of people in the room that are also doing similar businesses where, you know, they need to acquire a user base but also have the supply there as well, and they're building that side of the business. Um, well, first of all, there's a tremendous amount of literature out there about marketplaces. Uh, many of the best writers are, uh, are the U.S. bloggers, VCs, entrepreneurs themselves, startup grind speakers in the U.S. I've met some of them in person. Um, really, really good um, literature. So I can't possibly, I, I'm not the best at it, I can't possibly explain all the things, but I would say that the common thread, if I may name one thing, would be to start small, focus on a niche. Um, the reason is this, um, density is more important than breadth. Breadth, uh, breath, right? Yeah, yeah, broad. Density is more important than breadth, meaning that if you find, it's more important for you to find that one supplier, two suppliers, 10 suppliers, and that 10 customers or 100 customers that would actually keep those guys happy. Um, and having that cycle, even if it's small, is actually very important. Um, the moment you start broad, it's very, very hard to make everybody happy. So I think starting niche, starting small, starting narrow, to build liquidity in the narrow space, I think is usually very um, useful. And that's how all the big marketplaces, Airbnb, whatever, started. Yep. And you guys, you know, so you launched it and you've grown market share quite considerably, um, even ruffled the feathers of, of some of the competitors out there. Uh, talk to us a, a little bit about that. You know, it's not an easy thing to go through, but what are some of the lessons that you learned, uh, you know, going up against a big incumbent? Oh, I should hope so. We ruffled some mad feathers. Um, uh, what are the lessons? I, well, for one, um, 
never underestimate uh, a, a powerful business. Uh, it takes a lot to to compete with them. Uh, they do have a lot more resources than you. David versus Goliath, sort of. Uh, it's true. And in this particular case, to be to be quite frank, right? Like Republic Group is a company I always expect, always respected. The founders are great people and always respected them. I just thought that should be another product in the market. There's space for two. Um, and uh, so, um, but certainly, I think we, we compete hard, and it's, uh, this, it takes a lot to do it. It's great. You guys also uh, have acquired a company. Uh, you acquired Urban Indo in Indonesia um, to become now the largest residential property portal in Singapore and Indonesia by listings. Um, what was that like, and how did you know it was the right time to actually? go into Indonesia and enter that market via an acquisition versus starting 99 Co in the market? Um, actually, so the, the, to clarify that backstory, we were already in operating Indonesia for almost a year before we did the acquisition. Um, we were in a different, slightly, slightly different business there. Um, we were actually more of a B2B business than a B2C business. We didn't have a consumer-facing portal in Indonesia, but we have been there for a year. And we mostly work as a, as a tool or as a marketplace between the developers and the agents. Um, so the problem we're trying to solve there is, a, is something that, again, I, I only learned during the course of my um, you know, study of at 99.co that, oh, there's a whole different sets of opportunities in real estate that exist that I didn't even know about. Um, which is that in Indonesia, the developers can't reach, all the agents that re agents can't reach, all the developers, and you need a marketplace between them. It's a B2B marketplace. Um, <clears throat> so, and we did that, and then we, we, the opportunity came along to build a consumer base. We, we've been thinking about building it. It's very costly. It takes a long time. Um, there are, at that point, seven players in the market. Um, none of them making money. The market was pretty saturated already. Oversaturated, overcompeted. Um, everybody was throwing money at the market, um, and I think this was the. I think the euphoria of Indonesia as a market was even higher two years ago than compared to now. Um, so um, the amount of capital injected just did, didn't make sense. Nobody was making money. Um, so and I think at that point we didn't want to start a consumer portal. And fast forward to today, most recently, almost six months ago, we saw the opportunity to say that well, actually um, there are great companies that we can you know we can we can bring into the bring into our family and help grow and help build a business model and we put a trigger it's slightly opportunistic um, to to find the right time uh, I don't think it's very easy to determine whether it's the correct time so the way we think about it is that we keep building we keep doing what we think it is and if there's a if there's a way to accelerate what we do um, you know, even if you pay a bit more, but we can accelerate our growth by 2x, and it's, you do the math, it's worth it. Okay, let's do that. And you kept the Urban Indo name, actually. You didn't, it's, if you go on the website, it's Urban Indo, a 99 co company. Was there enough brand equity there that it made sense to keep it, or did you consider also making it 99 co and just keep the branding universal across? The region. Yeah, so it, it's a difficult question. I think it's, it's a question we're still thinking about how do we make, bring more alignment, bring more um, value. So I think some of the considerations were this. And maybe to kind of take a step back, right? Like sometimes you don't have to reinvent all the wheels. Um, so if you look at our competitors, Property Guru owns Ruma.com in Indonesia, which is a, one of the top three players. Uh, I Property owns Ruma123 in Indonesia, which is, again, different brand name. Right? Look and feel is the same. You look at it, you know it's iProperty. You look at Ruma, you know it's Property Guru. Um, and say so that, hey, that's a pretty good strategy. Do we need to shake up the thing so much and completely rebrand it? Maybe we don't. And we did tests with agents. We did tests with consumers. The brand equity does exist. Um, so is there any reason to shake that up? Maybe not for now. What is the pros? What are the benefits for us to consolidate the brand? Or well, maybe it's really only for investors to feel good about it. <laughs> so. Does the market really, does, do Singaporeans look in, look in Indonesia? Do you have a Singaporean who's trying to buy Indonesian property and try to type in 1990 and finding nothing? Not really. Usually the other way around, right? Or maybe the <laughs> other way around, right? So not really. And I think we can build enough bridges, technically speaking. Yeah. So it's just kind of whole planning process and decided, okay, we'll stick with that. Right. And do you see expansion opportunities in other markets in ASEAN and possibly even broader than that, uh, where you'll take the same strategy? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'm, as, as our competitors have, have done, they've bought several companies. We will certainly look to have the same goal that we share and compete for, which is to be the largest property tech company in Southeast Asia. 
Um, that's pretty clear. We write it on our wall. Um, and um, so in, when we enter a market, we'll look to either build or buy, so for sure. And how do you guys see things like machine learning, AI, um, art of, or, or, or I guess virtual reality for the property space? I mean, I see a lot of you know, uh, people with VR headsets on now. How do you see the, the, the changes in technology that we're seeing now impacting the prop tech space? Um, I think, the, okay, so two very different categories, AI, AI and ML. Um, as a category, I think it's pretty powerful, um, especially on um, helping suggest to, to customers the, the relevant listings or relevant data they might be looking at. And there are many more applications as well, I think. So that, that's pretty powerful. Um, but a lot of it we may not build in-house. Actually, there are very good um, companies out there who's already building a lot of this. Uh, libraries or algorithms and so on. I think we, we, we'll work with some, a lot of them. Um, from a, um, uh, from a uh, VR perspective, uh, I think the property space would probably be a legged in the sense that you wouldn't see property application driving the adoption of headsets. You might see once everybody has a headset, we'll give you a different experience. Um, the reason is because one of the one of the things that I learned about our our space is that the the, the frequency of being buy, buying property is so low, yeah. right? Once in five years, whatever, right? So um, even renting once in a year, once in two years, um, you're not going to in over invest too much in trying to experience something different. And if you uh, you know, so in terms of uh, if there are no already headsets existing in the market, would VR exist for property? Probably not so much. So, but the day that there's a lot of VRs, then you would absolutely see VR experience being built for property. Right. And you guys have, you know, so you're the largest residential property portal in Singapore and Indonesia. You've started to break into the commercial space now. Tell us about your thinking there and how you knew it was the right time to, to conquer the, the commercial property market. Yeah, I think for us, pretty straightforward. Um, <laughs> natural extension. <laughs> Net, A is natural extension. B is... You know, you face problem as a user. You want a better product. That's always going to be there underlying. And we talk to now. We talk to many users, right? Now we now if from a market standpoint, we have about, about one third of the demand in this market coming to us um, on the residential space. Now, uh, a lot of them they run office. They want to buy a shop house. They want to buy a warehouse. They want to invest in commercial property. Whatever it is, um, they said, hey, you know, I'm looking for why why can't I look for look for a warehouse here. Um, so that need existed, and uh, obviously our competitor also has the. Actually, this is even less crowded. Um, in the commercial space, there's only one portal, which is Commercial Guru, owned by Property Guru, uh, and and uh, so um, and we look at that product and say, well, there's so much to to do, um, and we decided that hey, we should do it. And I think that's one one end. The other end, what drives it really is that today we have 90% of Singapore's agent using our app every month. Um, 30, 40, almost 40% almost use it every day. So, and a lot of these same agents actually are marketing commercial properties. They actually have they're commercial. They're doing both. So they, they're doing, doing both. So actually the drive from consumer exists, but existed much, much stronger from the agents. The agents were telling us, guys, come on, do something. Like I've got, like I'm marketing 80% of my properties on your platform. Why don't you let me just finish it and do the rest of 20% with it? Like, I don't know how much, because they're already used to putting up listings with us and so on. So the variable effort for them to also put commercial properties is not that high. So they want to do it now. And this is different from, let's say, two years ago. If you try to do everything at once, they were like, you don't even give me rental demand. Why would I bother doing something else? So, so I think that's getting the timing right for that. And where do you see, kind of, how's the next year shaping up? Like, do you have new projects on the horizon or...? Anything you can kind of give us a glimpse of as to, you know, some new things you might be launching or doing? Yeah, a whole lot. Um, I, I think we are, you know, um, <laughs> as one of our buddies like love to say, uh, from Carousel, he likes to say we're only 1% done. I, I think we're 1% done or, or less. Um, so 99 to go, right? We're 99 yeah. to go. Oh, yeah, I did. Uh, nice one. Good one. <laughs> so, yeah, 99% to go. So, um, we're 1% done in the sense that property is such a deep and broad topic. Um, there's many projects we're working on. Um, so, some of the stuff you mentioned, I think, is a almost like a bread and butter evolution that we'll do AI, ML, um, better listing recommendations and so on. That's one part of it. Better experience, maybe not VR, there are things that we're working on there. 
uh, better 3D visualization, so we're working on some of those things. Uh, I think that's almost just like a hygiene factor. It's not really that different. Um, what we are really working on will be quite different and I hope to bring to market soon. Yeah. And you guys are also, um, you know, I've got a marketing background, so I got to ask about content marketing, you know. You guys are actually, you broke into that about a year ago, roughly? Yeah. yeah. How's that going and do you see you guys yourselves turning into not just a property portal for people to go shop for property, but also, you know, a content kind of publishing platform? Yeah, absolutely. So um, content is a big part of what we do. Um, so we've, we did this exercise about, what, maybe three years ago. We map out what actually people go through. This is especially, we started as a rental portal. I don't know if you, if you know that. We started purely only on rental. We didn't even do um, I think I searched, buying property. I think I searched for some <laughs> rentals uh, on there at one point. Yeah, so when we got into helping people buy property, uh, and of course helping agents sell property, um, we realized that the buying journey is so long and so much of it is, is not on the portal when you search, right? You are, you are the, you, it starts with Googling, how do I buy a property? This is how a customer start looking at, okay, and then they will start, start asking, what can I afford? Um, what is TTSR? What is what, how much more, more mortgage? What are the rules around this? And you realize that this this whole piece is completely disorganized. And some part of it we will solve by you know inserting a mortgage calculator, which is pretty obvious. But there's a lot of it that cannot be addressed, um, especially with more and more complex government rules and more and more considerations and more and more train stations and more and more things to to map out. Um, and so we decided the content was a big part of it to help the user through his journey and not just at the point of search. Yeah. And property media is you know, pretty big here in Singapore um, and your competitor has gotten into that space as well. So uh, I'm gonna stop talking right now. We're gonna open up the floor to questions. I know we've got some questions out there. <laughs> is this Sorry, <laughs> you walked right, I was pointing at it. <laughs> You told me it was her. Well, the good thing turn. is we have a lot of hands up because, uh, yeah, so we'll, we'll, we'll start with our, uh, you're visiting from Jakarta actually, right? Yeah, yeah. I'm originally from Estonia. Yeah. I, I need to Great. say that, otherwise I'm betraying my country. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah, I look Indonesian, right? Anyway, um, can you tell us a little bit more about your B2B business before you acquired Urban Indo? And sure. connected to that, what are you doing today to, for the owners in a let's say self-servicing where uh, self-servicing industry for the owners uh, specifically, right? Thanks. Sure. Um, so first question: the B two B business. Uh, so essentially, long story short, is pretty straightforward. We are still a tech platform. We have an app. Only agents can download it. You have to register your agency and all those details to to get assessed. This is in, in Jakarta, in, in Indonesia. Um, so the problem that we're trying to address is that we found out that there's a whole lot of developers there, ma many, many hundreds of developers. Um, they don't always know all the agents in the market. And really it's impossible because you do have you know, a lot of agents in the market, um, you know, agents, small agencies, no name, no brand, sitting at a corner shop somewhere. Uh, you, you live in Jakarta, you know that. Um, so so they, they, the developers can't reach all the agents even though the agents have potential customers who might be interested in their product. Um, and the agents can reach all the developers as well. So there's agents who's like, oh no, I've got a customer, his kid is going to a school, you know, West Jakarta, and they're looking for an apartment to buy for him to stay there. He doesn't know what to do. Um, so um, we, did, we looked at that problem and said, oh, actually we should, there should be an app that facilitates this information flow. So we essentially go on and build this app, put, get all the developers to agree, uh, to put the information on this you know, whole set of the information, including property brochures, price lists, inventory availability, all of the stuff that you might need to decide whether I'm interested in an apartment. In the end, of course, the customer, if they so decide that he's interested, he'll still turn up on, on site to buy, generally speaking. Right? Most of the time, the actual viewing and transaction still happens on site. Um, but the information is actually what we're trying to solve for the agents. Now the agents are able to tell the customers, okay, well this is available, this is the pricing, and because you have enough density of availability, you can actually start comparing pricing and say, that, oh, is that a fair price to pay? And I think that's a very important part of that as well. Um, so that's basically the business over there. Um, and generally we charge the developers for, for doing that. Um, so that's the first question. The second question was, 
Homeowners. Um, homeowners uh, in Indonesia, urban Indo, we do accept homeowner listings. So there are a lot of homeowners who put up their own listing. It provides a lot of um, diversity and interesting listings. Um, you get all sorts of things that that's being on sale there. You know, mm. big pieces of land, whole buildings, tree houses, uh, all sorts of weird stuff is is on sale there. Um, but in Singapore, I think it's a bit of more boring country. 98% uh, of listings are by agents. There's really no real reason um, to, to have homeowner listings. Um, to have homeowner listing also introduces a, a different set of problems because you have to verify the homeowners, verify it's not a scam. It's very easy to have scams. You can go to Craigslist and find homeowner listings and you will get scammed. Um, so, we, so we decided that you know, it's the problem is just not, uh, the, kind of the, 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 the demand for homeowner to sell their own property is just not large enough to to, to warrants trying to solve that problem. Very good. So uh, this is my first time here, so we, I'm very excited. And Welcome. I have a lot of questions, but I'll start with the first one first. And uh, that is, uh, you know, this is almost like an unorganized sector that you're, you're trying to bring organization to uh, the real estate sector, although you had a competitor <laughs> before, yeah. and it's kind of organized yeah. already. Uh, how do you bring together the two pieces together? You know, you had the agents, then you also had the listings that they will list out. Uh, how do you know that your agents are good? How do you reach out to them? Uh, you know, how do you bring them? How do you take that first few steps to have your, let's say, the first 10 agents to list on your site? Yeah, um, uh, it's a great question. It's something that we continue to, we, we struggle with and we continue to struggle with. Um, I think running a marketplace is always a balance between how do you increase the quality of your offering, um, at the same time um, making sure that your you you can um, you get all your suppliers to be happy. Uh, so what that means is that how to answer your question actually. So we wanted one of my problems I wanted to solve was that I wanted real photos. And I don't know if you guys, you guys remember, you were here in Singapore five years back. If you try to search for a property, whether for rent or whatever, you get that like, damn picture of a toilet bowl. Um, so, if, whatever, <laughs> like crazy. Uh, so that was what I, or, or, or photo at all. Sometimes it's just like photo, like stock photo or some outside building, right? Like so nothing to do with the, the house itself. Um, so, and that was the first, one of the first problems we want to solve. And initially we took an approach, which was wrong, we took an approach to say that we only want a listing that has good photos. And we had you know, about one-tenth the number of listings compared to Property Guru, of course. Um, and we thought the quality method. And of course, it's like easy to think about this because, oh, Airbnb did it that way, so we'll do it that way. And we even give them a photographer to do it for them. And we, we put in, you know, we, either we, our team did it ourselves or we get a photographer to do it for them. We bear the cost. Uh, it turns out it's completely the wrong strategy because it turns out that if you're looking for a property to rent and especially to buy, you care a lot more about the price than you would compare to if you're on Airbnb looking to rent, looking to, for a few days stay. That's a 200 buck purchase. A $4,000 rental for 12 months is $50,000. So you actually are willing, most consumers, this is where they always complain to us, I want better photos, but if you give them a listing that's a better price, with no photos, they will still take it. Right? They will still turn up and see, is it real or is it not real? They're willing to bear the pain to, for the opportunity that's a better price, and maybe it's real, maybe for some weird reason, privacy, whatever reasons, they don't have photos. Lazy and lazy, it doesn't matter. As long as it's a better price, they're interested in it. So that's where we realized, oh, actually comprehensiveness was much more important than quality of listings. Um, that's where we switch our strategy and say, okay, let's go wide. Let's get all the agents who have rent, we stick with rental still, but we get all the agents who have rental listings to make sure that when the customers comes in, they can see all the rental listings at least. So I don't know if that answered your question, um, because once we make the switch, we were indiscriminate in asking agents, okay, put all your listings, we'll develop algorithm to try to show the best one first, and develop filters to help the customers to find what they were looking for, and maybe we'll get into, get into um, you know, more sophisticated technology in, Let's say, for example, uh, computer vision, recognizing objects. I can say you're looking for you know, a, 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 a property with a um, blue wall. You can actually search for it someday. Um, we'll give choice, but give tools to find the correct choice. That's how we, that's how we search it. What, what I wanted to know actually was that uh, you know, when you started up and you had property grew as a competitor, very competitor in front of you, 
why would an agent actually come to you to list the property and how would you approach him to solve that problem? Yeah, um, it's, it's a difficult question. It's what we struggle with. Um, I mean, today we're proud to say that we have more listings than a competitor. Um, and in, at least in the residential space, we do. Um, it took us no, four years. Uh, so almost four years later, then we managed to achieve it, even though we were free for two years. <laughs> like we, we were naive, right? Like, free, why won't you use it, right? Like, what, what's, what the hell is stopping you? Um, but free was not good enough. Free, still effort, effort is time, effort is cost, they won't do it uh, until we actually deliver results. So we just have to do a lot of the hard work in convincing them. In some cases, if they are more longer term strategic thinkers, for example, there are, agents are also very smart business owners, right? A lot of the agents are business owners themselves. So they would think long term, five years, 10 years, I'll, you know, sometimes our pitch to them is, look, if you don't do it, what's gonna happen? You're gonna sit with a monopoly who's gonna increase price on you 2x every year, and you need competition. So they're like, okay, you know what, I'll be patient, I'll wait for you, okay? I'll, I'll keep helping you build, I'll wait for you, and hopefully you can become a formidable competitor and bring some price equity into the, into the market. So sometimes we do that. I got a quick question to follow up on that. You were free for the first two years, and then you changed the business model and started charging for the listings. What was that like? Because it, it's, it's hard to go from a free model and get upsell people to actually pay, right? Yeah. Um, so uh, actually we're today, even, even today we're freemium. So there is a free tier, you can use the free tier. Yeah. Um, so you just get some less of features. It free. You, yeah, yeah. So, so the listings are there. So our principle is that we have to make sure that all of the, all of the listings are there. When the customer look for it, they can find it. Um, so we're still freemium. So that makes charging some people not that much harder because we're not forcing them to make a decision. Right. Um, but it also means that a lot of people would just choose to stay with the, stick with the free tier. So. What can you do when it's free sometimes? <laughs> yeah, I mean, we, we, get, we get grilled by our investors, right? Why don't you, you just shut off the free tier and more people will pay you? I was like, but we need to make sure the customers get the best results. Yeah. So given that, that, given the that being the- the listings could go away. That's not a, non that's not a monetary um, trade-off, right? Like if we, if we screw that up, we screw up ourselves. Like it's like permanent, it's a permanent damage. So yeah. I think we should give it to the lady. The lady. Yeah. My girlfriend. Ass assuming <laughs> she's still a lot of my questions. Ass actually. Assuming you still have a question. <laughs> I know. So um, you actually answered my first question, which because I'm from Jakarta. Oh, hi. Um, yeah. So uh, it's good to know that you you're kind of like like acknowledging the issue about like this free rental. Yeah. So because I know for sure, like I, when I was living there, yeah. my family lives there. So but I rent a room or I rent an apartment yeah. because. Traffic was terrible, so it's good to know that. So my second question was that: um, Do you look into villas? Um, okay. Maybe Bali is a good place, but yeah, I think yeah. not even Bali. Like I think Jakarta is a yeah. place because I think these places, like massive houses, massive villas in yeah. Jakarta or Bogor or like yeah. Bali, yeah. they have good pictures. Yeah. They have really amazing properties. Yeah. They have amazing websites. Yeah. But if when you say like book uh, book now or like uh, reserve whatever it actually links back to an email um that at the end of the day the property manager would just whatsapp you yeah. uh, it's fake so i think um i mean and it's just like a big buck right like what you said it's like four nights for twenty thousand dollars or something like that so just wondering if that's something that you're looking into as well so um okay so to answer your question if you look and uh, look on urban indo uh, there are villa listings for long-term rental and for sales um occasionally you will find an owner or a manager just put it up for okay this is also open for short-term rentals um but not that frequently um so it's not a matter of villa property type we're very open to um, it's the same use case if you want to buy, if you want to rent, if you want capital gains. It's the same mindset that we are building the product for. You will hunt for the best deals. You will take six months to buy a property. All the behavior is the same. But we won't do short term. Um, I do think the villas who are good should be onboarded onto something like a Trovaloka. Um, and because, again, short term, you need reliability, you need quality, you need attractiveness. Right? You, you're not optimizing for the best, um, best, best deal for the dollar. You're optimizing for, I see it, I like it, I'm gonna enjoy my stay. And I don't mind even if it's like a 10% more expensive, a little bit more expensive than the other shitty looking place. Like I'd rather pay for a good experience. So I think that's something that we are not built for. There's a travel company. So a travel company like Traveloka, maybe Airbnb would, should take care of that, it's not us. 
Other questions? Benson. I used to work with Benson, actually. Yeah, just a bit of background, because he mentioned of our previous uh, relationship. Well, he was working in a publishing firm that publishes Palace, which I'm heading up the sales as a VP. So I haven't been in property media for the past 10 years, including with a company that Property Guru recently acquired, yeah. Ensign Media. Yeah. And having worked with your peers in Malaysia, including iProperty, um, I'll just name a couple of your peers or competitors in the region. Sure. Now, it would occur that these peers would have um, a more integrated offering across different media channels. So for instance, Property Guru by you know, virtue of their acquisition, they actually have the property awards now. Sure. And of course, iProperty being backed by REA, they also have their own awards and they do other seminar type events as well. So going forward um, for 99.co, do you have plans to perhaps look at other channels to broaden perhaps your reach to the developers besides serving just the agents? Yeah, so absolutely. Um, so you are right. Uh, of course, some of our very formidable competitors are quite more advanced in some of this. Um, so one area they are much more advanced than we are is, for example, developing the media side of the business, um, capturing some of the developers' marketing budgets, um, and also giving them value in terms of delivering a service to them. Um, so in, in that area, so I would say that, well, working on it, um, I don't know what you're doing in Palace. If you want to help us run our award show, uh, very welcome to have a chat. I don't know if there's something you're interested in. Uh, <laughs> but uh, so um, definitely working on it. I, I, but I think we just want to stay focused to make sure that we get our core value proposition. Because if, like, if we don't have consumers, like all of these business units have no meaning, right? Only if we have an audience, then some of this actually makes sense. So we're still very focused on that being the core first. Well, I'm also quite um, privy to the sales performance, or rather the, uh, the uh, performance of your competitor, simply because I work in fintech, and I wouldn't say much about that, but we know that it's a very, very um, difficult industry to make money in, especially if you're just grounded on collecting or charging agents to pay for their listings, right? So. As of now, I mean, is 99.co making money? Uh, no, so we're definitely not profitable. Um, neither are seven out of the 10 property portals in US, UK, Australia, Japan. Um, Japan is profitable. Um, and so you name it, right? So there are, I, th I think about 15 property portal unicorns in the world. 70% of them are not profitable. Um, so that's kind of a strange thing to begin with. And on top of that, they have very good multiples um, on their revenue. Uh, what this tells us is, well, the marketplace actually thinks that the property, grow, uh, the property portals have a lot more room to grow. And that's indeed true, and that's how our, be our belief is. I, we, I do think that you know, charging agent is not actually going to be our business model, to be very frank. <laughs> so um, if, I, I, what we do believe is that building an audience, building a marketplace, that people keep coming back and they say, if I'm looking for a property, this is the site I go to. Um, there is so much more to do, um, whether it is you know, to work with the banks on, I don't know what you're doing in FinTech, but for example, there's a property is very, very much related to financing. Mortgages, barely scratch the surface on, on what that means. Um, we are only beginning to see alternative financing come up. Uh, another example, this, is, this just happened like two weeks ago. Uh, energy market is now being, um, uh, what do you call it? Privatized or opened up, if you will. So you have alternative energy providers, not just SP, right? If you just have SP, there's no business there. But if they're alternative energy providers, now they're coming to us, okay, well, somebody buys a house, somebody rents a house, can we provide them a comparison tool to show them, hey, we have a better product? Hmm. E easy plug for us, right? So there are many things we can do that actually to grow the business because finding a home is such a big activity, such an expensive activity. Um, so Agents are never going to be the, 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 the full business for us. And this is what we tell agents as well. You know, don't worry for us to, to, to go crazy and charge you. I think that's very short-sighted. I want to build a long-term business with you. I've got other business I want to build. My problem is I need to find capital to fund that until that point. So that's one of the challenges. Deregulation. I think that's the term we were deregulation. looking at. Deregulation, right. yes. Man with words. <laughs> uh, right here. Uh, 
Hi. You briefly touched on uh, finance, and one of the things that's transacted quite equally to property is actually the money for the rental or the purchase. Yeah. Yeah. What's your vision on, uh, on actually implementing payments within your ecosystem? Um, implementing payments as in paying rent through the system, that's probably... Escrow is an interesting one. Um, I think there's a problem that customers face. Let me, maybe I can, before, let me, let me have a show of hands. How many of you rent here have rented before? So a good half, maybe 70%, right? How many of you have gotten, at least you felt that you've gotten screwed over on the deposit? You can't get it back, there was problems. So uh, maybe a good 30, 40% of the 70%. Um, that's a problem. That's a problem to be solved. That's a problem that has ca that that's to be solved. That has money to be made uh, for the right service provider. Um, sometimes customers get screwed over because either they're not knowledgeable or they just don't want to deal with it. It's like you know, I have I have a full time job to work. I'm not gonna I'm I'm not gonna hassle, haggle with the owner for like five hundred bucks or a thousand bucks, even though that's real money. Um, maybe they're out of time. You know, they they have to go back to their country and they have two days left. It's like screw it. I'm gonna take the losses. Move on. Um, many problems that shouldn't exist. Um, so being able to be an escrow provider, may not be us, maybe may somebody else we're happy to partner with. I think somebody should build this business. Being escrow provider to arbitrate between the owners and the renters to make sure it's fair, make sure it's good. Yet at the same time, this is also beneficial for the owner because the good owner should get rewarded for being a good person. Right? The good owner should get rewarded. I, should, I would rather rent from an owner that I know is not going to screw me over. Right, so you, that's, that's a business to be built here. I don't know if that answers your question. Um, not so much as payment, but escrow, yes, definitely. Payment, paying a rent, you know, bank transfer is free, so it's hard to compete with that. It's true. Go right here in the front, and then we'll go to the back. Hi, uh, Alex from Cutie. So I run an um, online marketplace and platform for online virtual classes. So I have two questions. One, uh, mainly, you know, how long did it take you to get towards your um, critical mass that you needed? And uh, what was like, the day-to-day -day, you know, sales operations like you know, <coughs> um, going forward? And my second question is um, about uh, the certain strategies that you, uh, your team might have you know, thought of um, implementing or you know certain strategies that you might have done, but uh, you know maybe not succeeded in before raising capital to you know acquire users. Okay, first question is what's the day-to-day -day operations like? Um, it, I don't know how to answer you. I'll say this large variety of things I do. Um, you know, spending time with users and agents, um, for example, is a large part of it. Um, spend time raising capital, spend time doing marketing, figure out online marketing, figure out technology, figure out product. Um, so all of it, I think, is, is a large variety. But what I can tell you is that how it's different from my last company is that there's much, much more hands-on, which actually is something that I like. I get to touch and feel our suppliers and our demand side, our customers. Um, I think that's meaningful to me. Um, the last company, we're building software. There's about 15 of us sitting in a room. Um, same thing day in, day out. It's great. We love the life. but We've never talked to a single customer. It's, it kind of got to get stale after a while. Um, so I like the hands-on, you know, touching people's lives. Um, so that's uh, what I can comment on that. The second question was... Um, uh, maybe like the strategies that you have thought of or you implemented, but have not succeeded before recently. Sure. Um, having only high-quality listings that only good photos, real photos, that was one that failed. So that was your question, right? That was one that failed. I'm sure I can name many more. Let me see what I can name. Uh, boom, 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 boom. Um, I, I don't know that many. Oh, okay. Well, for one, actually, we started, you know, one of the things that, one of the projects we started before we started 99.co is a project called Homey. Um, Homey is the, actually a, a roommate platform. Um, so it's for people to share apartments. Um, and that is a lot more, and we realized for that, for that project, it's a lot more social. It still exists, it still runs. Actually, there's still quite a lot of users using it. Um, so, uh, and it's a lot more social. You actually care, a lot of people actually care about who you stay with rather than where you stay or what, what, what's the apartment, right? Because, um, you know, no matter how nice the apartment is, if you live in a monster, then it's kind of a problem. <laughs> uh, so, um, so we, we basically build a product to help people find each other, at least evaluate whether it's a good fit. So Facebook Connect, you can see whether you have common schools, common friends, blah, blah, blah. Nothing, nothing surprising that you wouldn't have thought of. 
so we built that for roommates. Uh, where we failed was that, well, actually, there's no business in it. It was a great project. People liked it. You know, a lot of users use it, but there's no business in it. So we just kind of supported it as a community project. It keeps running. <laughs> Yeah, you guys sorted out back there. <laughs> okay, hi. Um, I'm coming from the landlord point of view. Uh, yeah, many people rent property here. I am a landlord. Um, I don't want to use agents because I have to give them one month commission. And when I want to, well, you know, right now the rental has gone down by about 40%. And in order for me to get my property out there, rented ASAP, I paid sometimes 1.5 months uh, commission. I'd rather give it to you, you know? So this is my viewpoint because in amongst the um, agents, there are ones who are really good. And I had a few who worked, but eventually they, they uh, found better pasture. It's a very stressful industry. Um, and then I'm left with a few that are not uh, performing. They like to, to fly by night kind of performance, you know. So um, if you could look into the aspect of the landlord, I, I'm sure if the price is correct and you tie up with, it used to be called Dragon Law, but now I think it's re um, brand to Zegel Law or something. It's a, uh, online um, um, contract, you know, and then you have three package ironclad proof, which no one can, you know, screw you. And then you have the one that's quite good, you know, everybody look at it and go like, okay, so three options, what kind of uh, a contract you want for the landed property and the tenant. So I think that is a area that you want to look to because I think the property uh, rental market is quite traditional and we've been always using agents. And I think we should bypass that. I'm not very good for the agents over here, but uh, <laughs> that's what I feel for a landlord point of view. Yeah, that's it. Okay, I don't know if that demanded a question. You demand an answer. Did you demand an answer or you just comment? Is thank you for your comments enough? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's a good. It's it's uh, no. It's a good comment. Yeah, yeah. I, and I think a lot yeah. of people maybe you know the perception is with with people that are renting is there's a fallback if you have an agent to yeah. mediate if yeah. there's an issue. If it's just you yeah. and the landlord, then you know the perception could be maybe there's a problem there and you don't know how to solve it because there isn't a fair arbiter in the center. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I, I have to answer that. A lot of the time, the tenancy agreements are two years. Yeah. And sometimes when you want to look for the property agent who actually signed the uh, contract, and if the tenant were to destroy the whole entire flooring, for example, and you would like to take a portion of the deposit as you know a, a payment, a lot of time the property agent will not exist or they don't pick up the phone and quite a lot of these type of things actually happen. So I'm really go down deep in, hands on, really deep and dirty into this whole entire sector. So I think with your kind of a platform, it's really good, yeah, in that sense. Could yeah. be an opportunity there, maybe. Yeah, so to answer your questions, um, uh, some so my response is, um, so first of all, I, I think, I, I'm sure you have been a landlord for many years, and such as, I, I have been to myself, uh, so I am a landlord myself too. Um, I'm both a land, tenant and a landlord. So, um, and the reality is actually the agents do a lot more than we give them um, credit for in terms of just the kind of the level of effort that they put in to, to market your property, just open up the house for, for viewings. Um, so we did this experiment. We, we did try to find, so we went to Craigslist. So um, uh, at, when we, at the beginning of our journey to look at, okay, how about let's look for direct landlord listings and see what the experience is like. Um, of course, there's a lot of fake ones and scam ones. Filter that out. There are real ones as well. And the real ones, in the end, for example, to schedule a viewing was about five times harder. It takes five times more back and forth to even find a time to say, that, can I actually see the place? Um, agent is ready to open it up any time. So they're ready for business. Um, is that valuable enough for them to earn the commissions that's not for us to decide? Uh, so the second response to you is that us as a platform, 
want to provide variety and comprehensiveness. In order for, for us to be able to do that, we cannot go compete with our customers who say, oh, well, I'm going to... Uh, I'm going to do that. But what I do think is there should be somebody who re reinvent how the agency business work. Can they be more efficient? Can they charge you less? Can they deliver better value? Can they make sure that they are not absent when you have something to deal with? Mm. What incentive can give them or what incentive can, can, either they, can, can, can we give them such that for them to give you a better service if you feel that they're not, they not deserving their commission uh, in full right now? Um, so I think that's a question to be answered by the agents, not by us. So I also see that from your app, I can find the best agent in there. Instead of calling them to rent the property, I could look, hi, how are you? How are you going to perform in terms of this situation? That's one. Of course, I also see that you're very embracing of uh, new startups all the way to Indonesia. We have a local startup called Igloo Home. So if there's a viewing, it's very easy. Just type in the code and go in so we can embrace other startups as well. Okay, that's Love it. Igloo Home. It's an it's a electronic lock. They're one of the best in the world. Hi, great stuff. So two questions I have. First is, how difficult you feel uh, that you were the second entrant in the market? So had you wished you could be the first one over there? And now, what is your strategy to become number one in the market in terms of property portal? Keeping property guru in mind. Second question is, what are your marketing activities to make consumer aware about your site and get them on board? Okay. Um, so the first question, uh, how difficult it is, very difficult, extremely difficult. Do, I, do we wish we were the first? Some days, but then again, as with all business, if you're long enough, you grow stale, somebody will come along and challenge you, uh, especially if you're a monopoly. Um, I, I do think that if there's a balanced um, eco ecosystem somewhere, the, the likelihood of a challenge is less. Um, so in that sense that if we did, we were the first and we, we started 10 years ago, we will be exactly where Property Guru is now. I don't think they did anything wrong. They, they're a great company, great founders. They have done all the right things, but it's time to be challenged. It's time to bring in new audience, bring in new product, new technology. Um, so um, can't answer your first question. Uh, it's grass, grass is greener kind of, kind of question. Okay, yeah, just an uh, extension of the first. So how are you gaining market share of Property Guru? What are the things you are doing or what are the features you are adding to be getting market share out of Property Guru? Yeah. So the second question is, um, how do we acquire customers and markets? I think it's pretty standard, not too different from anybody else. We do Google marketing, Facebook marketing. We try to do as much free marketing as possible like I'm doing now here. So please use 99.co. We have pro more property listings. If you're looking for property to buy, you don't want to miss out on a good deal. It's a $2 million purchase or $1 million purchase. You only do it once in five years. Make sure you find the best deal. So plug finish. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so free marketing, as much as possible, we have so much less money than our competitor. So we have no choice but to use as creative as possible. But the fundamental is this is the engine, right? The engine is that we took us about three years to actually get it right, that whenever a customer comes in, it converts well. We keep the customers. We see him coming back. We see him over a six months, sometimes nine months purchasing journey, come back month after month. Um, retention is what we needed to, needed to build. Uh, once we build the retention and, the, and, and having that done right, uh, and this involved many things, right? This involved everything from sophisticated things like recommendation engines, make sure that you see a good listing if, when it, the moment it pops up, to just you know, being good at sending you an email or a notification and say that, hey, you might be interested in something, to content and say that, hey, you're this part of the journey, you might be interested in mortgage. Let me educate you about mortgage. Um, so just do all, doing all of that to try to match the customer's journey well, to build the engine well, uh, because once you have that engine, I, to, to put it quite bluntly, it is a matter of pumping more capital, more fuel into the engine to, to get it running faster. Um, so I think today, finally, after three, three and a half years, we, have, we have feel pretty confident we're at a point where we actually have a pretty good engine coming, uh, working, but it took, a, took, took us a long time. Time for one more question. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Jensen. So I'm a wannabe entrepreneur, so I just want to ask you more operational stuff. Uh, how was your like first product um, MVP like when you started to move uh, 99.co out? You know, like how perfect or how imperfect was it? Uh, and the second question on that is that uh, how do you prioritize your features based that you know a lot of people when they look at what you have and they like I want this, I want that, I want everything. How do you make that priority? Yeah, thanks. Yeah, uh, very hard question to answer. Um, the I mean, Reid Hoffman of LinkedIn like to say that you know if you are not ashamed of your first product, you're too slow, you're too late. Um, I do think that is true, and I do think that he says it because more often than not, he observes that people take too long to launch. Not that it should be bad, it's just that in general, things are too slow. 
you should go out faster. Um, that's why he made that kind of um, dramatic comment. It's not actually true that he wants products to be bad. Um, and I think the trick really is to kind of mitigate that, to, to, to mitigate the comment. The, con the trick is really, can we find the one single core value proposition and stay focused on it and test the one hypothesis? What is the one thing you do that is right that people are willing to take the sins of everything else you're not doing right? Uh, I think that's the right way of thinking about it. I think what is that one thing you have to have very, very clear hypothesis and test that. Yeah. That's all the time that we have for, I think. We could probably go for another half hour uh, with some great questions here. Thank you um, for being here. Um, but I just want to thank you so much for coming to Startup Grind, sharing your insights, uh, being very candid with us. Uh, let's give a big round of applause for Darius. Thank you.